Hi, this is Lena Jensen, and I'm here with Mr. Mike Staples at the Men's Network Building at 4242 West North Avenue, Sherman Park, Milwaukee. Today is July 14th at approximately 9, oh, 10, 10, 10 a.m. Um, and I'm doing an interview with Mr. Michael Staples. Also in the room is Chelsea Waite helping with the recording. This interview is sponsored by Professor Rijit Sen and the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's Buildings, Landscape, Cultures Field School and will be stored at the Goldenmeyer Library Archives. At this time, could you please give verbal consent to record and share this content for yes, research? Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I just wanted to start with some general questions about you. So where were you born and where did you grow up? Oh, born right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Third floor, to, third floor of Mount Zion Hospital, because that's where the baby department, water, where you see, so, and lived here all my life, okay, so. How many siblings did you, did you grow up with siblings? Oh, how many? I'm in the middle. Nine, it was nine of us all together, because I always remember myself as being in the middle. So, four above me, four below me. And then, um, did you like having a big family? Oh yes, you got yeah. you. Oh, a big family is a lot of fun, realistically, because uh, we were a outdoor sports family. All right, so that that made during my lifetime camping, hunting, fishing, that made it all the more be more better. Um, so yes. Uh, a large family, I like it. And then what did you study in your education? You mentioned architecture. What did I study? Oh, brother. <laughs> Should I go through that? Um, my passion in high school, was, that's what we start with, um, was mechanical and architectural drawing, okay? Then uh, we were, I went to Rufus King High School, and we started what we call the, the construction course, started, a program rather, started at Rufus King, I was part of that. But my primary thing was mechanical and architectural drawing. Then when I left, um, when I graduated, I went to MATC for architecture, mechanical drawing, okay? But I only was able to, spend one year or half, well, half a, uh, one semester there because I was employed also. And when you're employed working in a factory, I worked at Babcock and Wilcox, when you're in a factory, you know, your shift can be changed. So shift was changed. Um, so that means I had to drop out of school. Now, I tried to go back to school, then I went to uh, MATC a few years later, I was going to study electrical engineering, okay? I got it, an industrial accident, I had an industrial accident at Babcock, so I had to drop out of that then. Then when Babcock and Wilcox closed up, I went to Stratton College for electronics. but. Babcock had closed up. I had restarted my business, the home improvement business. And so I was doing a job. I signed on to do a job on 76 in Hampton. And I couldn't go to school full time at Stratton and do this job. So I had to drop out of Stratton. Okay? So 20 years later, after that, seeing that advertisement about uh, ITC Tech teaching you how electronics, what have you. So I went, and it, the hours that they were offering fit my schedule. So I entered ITT Tech and um, got an associate degree there in electronics, even though the majority of my work and passion has always been carpentry per se or home improvement. What, has anything specific drawn you to that? Like, why did you, did you always know you wanted to do that? 
was that uh, home improvement? Well, it was just home improvement or carpentry in itself or woodworking. It gives you ability to actually create. I mean, take a block of wood, piece of wood, and just do whatever. I don't care if you if you were into the hand carving business. You know, you can make a statue or whatever. It's just the idea. Just the difference between woodworking and metal working you can actually complete a project 10 times faster so you're able to see what you're doing within a few hours so I just had just a passion just a passion for woodworking is there anything that you've created that's been your favorite or favorite project you've worked on the favorite project, um, well, my favorite woodworking uh, project in a, in a shop class, I don't know if you ladies know a skeleton key. See, I made a gigantic skeleton key, okay, like the old key. I made a gigantic, it was 32 inches long, skeleton key. And I remember one of the gentlemen I was working for when I was a young guy, uh, he wanted me to present it to the mayor, but I didn't. You know, I, I that's not my. You know, so um, that was Mr. Cone. I call him call him Grandpa Cone. But uh, the project that uh, who installed the elevator, oh, put that, that elevator in, actually. Me and my men, and or the workers rather, build the overall shaft construction and things of that nature. But my biggest uh, achievement in the home improvement business would actually be Genesis Beauty Salon. I took what used to be a an old Piggly Wiggly store, and that's the one I was referring to that I stopped out, dropped out of. Stratton to go do and turn turn it to a beauty salon. So that's but I've had so much satisfaction in the field because we'll put it this way Babcock and Wilcox closed up in nineteen eighty three. Me and my partner, Kenny Schultz, we started a company our jobs handyman service. We had started actually a couple of years prior to Babcock closing up. But the thing is, I've been fortunate because we only made just one set of cards, you know. Um, and I have I haven't had to uh, I haven't advertised in thirty years, but I'm, you're still working, and that's. Because the the customers or the clients you meet, you do a good job. Hey, they, that's the best advertising there is. And I have been into some of the. I have worked for some of your most prominent people in the city, okay, and uh, constantly. So it. Uh, so those those themselves, the idea that a person. That extremely prominent that keeps calling you back to do more. That right there in itself, that's that's the excitement there. Because they're calling you to come do whatever. Uh, they give you the opportunity to say, okay, well look, I want to remodel my kitchen. Okay. Can you do it? Okay. And don't too many women we would say because we're dealing with the wives also um because women have a tendency to love their bathrooms and kitchens you know that's just a thing so uh it's been extremely um well rewarding and i've always uh, and from that from what i've learned and what i've been through that's why i always uh would tell the younger men and the men that um i come in contact with if you know how to use a hammer you will never starve, you know, because there's always 
and I use the, the, the word hammer as a metaphor to where it's just tools themselves. If you know how to use them, you can always get employment. You know? You'll always be able to feed yourself. All right, well, switching subjects a little bit, do you want to tell us about your role at Washington High and kind of how you started um, and explain the program? Well, see, that's the sad news. When I say sad news is the men's network with our particular agenda is trying to do what can we do in the community. So we had looked at Washington High School. We want to actually be mentors, okay, of the students there. And when we went and took a tour of Washington, um, as we took the tour, I looked at the shop classes. They were closed. They were closed and being used as storerooms. The machines were there, but they were using it as a storeroom. Okay, now, that really bothered me. It bothered me for the simple fact that I spent all my time at, well, when I was at Rufus King, remember I told you I started, uh, studied architecture and uh, the mechanical drawing, and then I also was in the wood shop for, for the full four years, you know. And now, with that particular knowledge or training or experience in a shop, and I started at 18 working for Babcock and Wilcox, which uh, neither one of you know who those are, but Babcock and Wilcox, if you know, you're not old enough either. Um, do you remember the largest nuclear accident in, in the country? It was Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania, okay? Now, Babcock and Wilcox was the makers of those nuclear reactors. So the plant that I, I worked at here was one of 33 plants. We were the tube making facility where we made seamless tubing, okay? Um, you think uh, what a seamless tubing got to do with anything, but just think about a helicopter. Helicopter's got four blades up that it's turning, right? And it's a shaft that's, you know, holding those blades. So that has to be a very special steel because your life is dependent on that shaft, correct? So, but anyway, I started working at Babcock and Wilcox, and then, and this is what just having that high school education and what I was taught in school as far as the trades go, as far as the shop class, things of that nature. I walked up the ladder of, of success at Babcock, okay, to where is, um, I became an office clerk, scheduling steel in the, in, the, in the mail office, scheduling the steel. Then I became an assistant foreman in the steel yard. Then I became the foreman of the steel yard. Then I became an assistant mill foreman of the mill itself, the hot mill, and that was the, the backbone of the plant, the mill, because that's all we made was seamless tubing from it can be as uh, small as two inches in diameter, and it can be 100 feet long. Seamless tubing, you know. It's hard for you to imagine that. See, see when I say seamless tubing and things of that nature. Uh, just one second here. There we go. Um, when you think of a seamless tubing, do you know of anything that's a seamless tubing? I just wanted to think real. I said seamless tubing. There are glass tubes for chemistry and. No, st we talking steel now. I'm gonna water give. You, I'm gonna give you. Hmm. Water. Water. No, water pipes got a seam. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Electricity. No. I know everyone's. Just think about it. Gasoline. You're for, no, you're, from, you're familiar with a needle. Think about it. The needle that... It's a tube mm -hmm. with no seams on it. It's a seamless tubing. So, so seamless tubing 
goes from as small as a needle, okay, oh, to what we were manufacturing, it was nine and a quarter inches in diameter with a wall thickness of maybe two and a half inches, okay? Uh, almost looked like gigantic uh, gun barrels of uh, your old uh, cannons. That's, you know, so, but again, I propelled up the ladder, okay, to where I was a supervisor or the high mill foreman. Now, that's, that was, oh, that was one of the most pre prestigious jobs in the plant. And I contributed that walk from the only training I had was in high school in the shop classes. And what, what you call the industrial arts program, which can, was wood shop, metal shop, uh, and your drafting classes, okay? So that is what, and that's what it upset him. That's the reason why it upset me when the shop classes were closed. It just, it burned me, you know? So after, and I'm, I kind of grumbled about it a little bit, and some other people heard my grumbling. Okay, they got wind of me just voicing my opinion. And uh, they went ahead and jumped on board and made it possible to get contact in contact with the principal of Washington. And finally, after a year, they were saying, okay, we'll let you open the shop classes up and, you know, reopen them. But, like I say, it's a sad situation simply because it was just a couple of days ago that um, I think I told you two ladies I had just came from um, Washington and had a little meeting there with the uh, manager of the uh, rec department for MPS. And the other lady, she, uh, she represented MPS and she was part of their liability and checking things out of things of that nature. And they've actually convinced me, say, well, Mike, we haven't checked these machines out yet. We don't know what the cost is gonna be to, to check them out. But we did check out the machines at North were recently checked within the last three years. And it's a much bigger facility. So they've more like convinced, persuaded me to start the program in North Division. So. And what do you think or hope the role of this knowledge um, for young adults could be in the community or in Milwaukee in general? Well, they get a job. Every, whew, if you knew, because I was out in the public life as far as working on people's homes, um, some of the simplest some of the easy, trivial tasks to be done in the house, a teenager can do. You know, I started working when I was 14, and I was working with two contractors that, were, that did the hand plastering, okay? And all the plastered walls. That's, you don't do that anymore. You, everything is drywall now. But the thing is, from me gaining a little knowledge and experience there, like I say, using your hands is, uh, hmm. you're able to create. You're able to feed yourself. If people, there's a lot of homeowners that don't want to do anything as far as physical work, because they might be a doctor's lawyers or accountants or whatever. But um, teaching the younger people home improvement or just how to use a tool, period. They're, and, if they've, and if they have a, an imagination, they can create and they can survive. And they can get, in the home improvement class, you don't necessarily have to be, it makes it possible for you to be hired, actually. Because you figure if a person comes in seeking employment or application, when he's got a little bit of, what should I say, machine training or whatever, it makes him 
there's opportunity of getting higher, it, 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 it increases. So. But okay, but I could be a little bit biased toward it because that's just my passion, so, you know. And then, do you want to talk a little bit about your role with the Men's Network and what that's all about? The Men's Network is basically just what I, but let's start from the very, 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 very beginning. I don't think, or well, you may have heard me elaborate on Joseph Emery Davis, okay? He is the older brother, okay, of Jefferson Davis, which was the Confederate president. And he purchased the land, some land after he retired. He was a lawyer. He purchased some land after retirement uh, in Mississippi, well over oh, a thousand acres or whatever it was. But anyway, he had slaves, two or three hundred slaves, okay? Now, Joseph Davis, and I'm going to keep this in a biblical sense now because that what brought me, you know, kind of like got my attention. Um, Joseph had a slave that ran away, okay? Now, History and some some uh, things record the fact that jo uh, that uh, if a slave runs away, he's considered a runner, and they cut a foot off or whatever, you know. But it wasn't so with Joseph. When the slave was returned to Joseph, what he did was have a discussion with the man. He talked to him. He saw the man had some intelligence. So he made, and the man's name is Benjamin. He made Benjamin, he let Benjamin be a, oh, what should I say, the property manager or, yeah, he let the overseer, okay? Then in the course of time, he told him, you know, uh, the blacks or the slaves should have their own little community. Okay, so, and this is on his plantation. So Jefferson, um, so uh, Joseph allowed, encouraged Benjamin to do this, start this. They had their own court system on the plantation where uh, criminals, per se, were being, ju being judged by their peers, by other slaves, okay? So now, it, uh, it worked out extremely well. I mean, Benjamin was making so much money that he was able to pay Joseph, pay Joseph so his wife didn't have to work, you know, as a slave. He would compensate Joe, Joseph. And um, one of the Benjamin's kids' name was Benjamin. I mean, not Benjamin, Isaiah. Okay, now Isaiah, uh, after Joseph sold the land, because we're talking Civil War time, right after the Civil War, or during the Civil War, right after, Joseph sold the land to Benjamin for 335000 Now, can you imagine that? We're talking 18-something, and you, how can a slave purchase something I mean, that $335,000, how many millions would that be today? But, so you know, it must have been doing extremely well as far as the plantation and the cotton. And so, Benjamin purchased the land, but, he, but after when Reconstruction started, now uh, you got, and um, the slaves were emancipated to where, you know, you're free. A lot left the plantation headed toward, I don't know why this, I don't know, it seemed like a lot went toward Pennsylvania. What 
Pennsylvania was probably offering, I don't know, good jobs or whatever, but a lot of people went that direction. But anyway, Benjamin missed the payment, okay? Benjamin missed the, missed the payment, and the, after a year, after Joseph died, then the daughters, Joseph had three illegitimate daughters, um, they took, they foreclosed on the property and took it from Benjamin. Benjamin, being heartbroken or whatever, you know, he, within a year, he died after losing the property. He had a son, Isaiah. Isaiah wanted to keep his father's dream alive of building their own community. So Isaiah, and we're, see, we're talking about Mississippi and this property that Joseph uh, Davis had, it was called Davis Bend because it was right on the Mississippi River and it looked like a, the water surround three quarters of it, okay? And it was called Davis Bend. But when Isaiah left the plantation after his father passed away, he purchased some land about 200 miles north, okay? And um, he started his own community, Isaiah Montgomery did, and it was named it Mount Bayou, Mississippi, okay? Now, that's Isaiah incorporating that community. It's less than a mile big as far as the area. Now, that's where that gentleman right there comes in at, William, okay? Because we're still on the topic of why I do what I do as far as the men's network. And that gentleman right there is my great-grandfather, okay? He was, he was born on the Jones Plantation in Kentucky. So now, I'm really a Jones, right? <laughs> I was born on the Jones family plantation. But he was purchased by Major Staples, okay, of the Confederate Army. Major, so they're doing their conversation that uh, Grandpa William and Major Staples had. He said, uh, if you do right by me, I'll do right by you. That's what he said. That was the agreement they had. And um, actually didn't have to have an agreement, just the idea how Major Staples treated my great-grandfather. And my great-grandfather, Major Staples was, a, like I said, a major in the Confederate Army. My great-grandfather was his servant, you know, the person that would dress him or whatever. Um, when major, major Staples got hurt, wounded in the Civil War, my grandfather traveled, I, I think it's a little bit better than 300 miles from the battlefield home, brought him home, okay? And so he was always with uh, the Major. Matter of fact, my great-grandfather took Major Staples' name, and his name is William Staples now. Like I say, but he came off the Jones Plantation, but he's William Staples now. So when my grandfather, great-grandfather, when he reached the age, okay, like I said, he was a servant in the uh, Confederate Army for the Major. He received a pension from the War Department, you know, e even though it was only $7.40 every three months, but he received a pension. And when you look back at things, you know, it's really unheard of that a slave would get a pension. You know, but he received a pension. And so he moved with his kids, wife and kids, which is my grandfather, and it was 12 of them, 12 of the kids, into that area, Mount Bayou. See, my great grandfather was a friend, okay, of Isaiah. And in the community, when you're trying to do something, everybody's on the same wavelength. You, well, 
you more it's like grow up, thinking, progress, you know. So um, my grandfather, which is the son of my great grandfather, is Jim. And Jim is my grandfather. His son is George. And George is the youngest of all of, of Jim's kids. And I'm a son of, of George. Now, one thing my father has always done with me, like I said, was nine kids in my family, but he's always, we'll put it this way, I have never went to bed hungry. I have never, I've always had a roof over my head. I have never, I have, okay, now, I'm going to tell, I'm going to say something that's actually a lie, but I have never stepped on the floor. But that's a lie because when I had got married, before your furniture came, you, know, you had to sleep on the floor. So that's the only time I ever slept on the floor. But as far as coming up, and see, my father was able to, he worked at A.O. Smith, he was able to provide for his family. And the things that he used to, the things that he used to tell me about his father, okay, which was Jim, and my father was saying, he grew up, and his, his father always provided the family. They had two cars. I said, wait a minute, back down, you know. So I found out that through the original whim, getting his pension, that allowed you to have some income. And um, the, that propelled them to have money. Um, because they were hard, the group of brothers were, they stuck together, worked, okay, together. Now, there's a story, my father's uncle, Uncle Joe, and you can, these particular names, you can actually look them all up to. There was a guy down there that had a plantation, Dockery, the Dockery Plantation. Now, if you check the history books on the Dockery Plantation, you'll see that he had about 10,000 people on the plantation. They weren't slaves or anything like that, but this is after Reconstruction. 10,000 people living on the plantation. And uh, he, it was such a large plantation, they had their own, what they call money, which was called script. And they owned stores on the plantation. Well, but anyway, that was how big Mr. Dockery was. But my Uncle Joe wanted to rent some land from... Uh, Dockery, and Dockery said he didn't have anything, but I got the 40 acres over there, the woods or whatever, and he said, if you clean it up, the trees down, brushes, all that, if you clean it up, I'll let you have it for two years free. And what did he do that for? When my Uncle Joe was told that, my Uncle Joe came right away to my grandfather, Jim, Jim assembled all the, the other brothers, called the brothers up, okay? The next day, they were the whole family. When you look at 12, um, 12, 12 siblings, and all of them's got kids per se. Now, um, I know you've heard, you, uh, you may or may not have heard about, uh, there's a, there was a, R&B singing group called the Staple Singers. Okay. That's my father's. Roebuck Pop Staples is my father's first cousin. But the reason why I say it, mention that is because their father name is Matt. Matt, which is a brother of my grandfather. But when you look at Matt, he had 14 kids. So I was just trying to give you an example of um, how many kids they were and their parents had control them as far as they were respectable, say, let's go to work, they went to work. So on that land that they cleared out, 
my father would always tell me to say, well, you got that many kids, you actually got a workforce. So, but the thing is they were able to clear the land, clear the land while they're clearing it, plant, and within the first growing season, they were taking cotton to the gin mill. See, that was for two years, rent free. And it is said, and it's probably still in the books down there in, 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 in the Dockery area, he made that statement that he had never, never let a man make a fool out of him again. Cause Dockery was assuming, was thinking, oh, you clear the, knock down 40 acres of land, woods and everything, it's gonna take you two years. But not knowing that Uncle Joe was involved in a family that didn't mind working, they pitched in. And that first growing season, like I say, they were growing cotton. Okay, so what my father has always told me of the stories of his, um, of what, how he grew up, what he had how they got it. I mean, I, let's see. There's another story where they were actually coming because of something my uncle did, which is my father's second oldest brother. There's an incident that occurred, okay? And they were, they got my uncle out of town to his house and there was a meeting held that night and they were coming to get my uncle lynching okay now or teach him a lesson we'll put it that way um but do you know in a small town who's the most powerful person it is in a small town no you would think small towns who has the most, no, who has the biggest voice in the, it's always the banker. Everybody needs the banker. Absolutely everybody, right? So during the course of the meeting, it was the banker. Cause they were, you know, they were having their meeting, getting ready to, you know, decide what they were going to do. And it was the banker that stood up and says, look, some to the effect that whereas don't, you go down there fooling with them staple boys because if they take their money out of the bank, the bank will go bankrupt. See, that's how much money they had amassed by just working hard and not squandering their, their money. We're talking about the whole family, you know, because like I say, the brothers, the sisters, sisters stay together. Now, I said brothers and sisters, right? Now, um, we'll, we'll make this next statement off the record, but one of the sisters, okay, one of the sisters of my grandfather, is her name is Ella, okay? One, one of the girls, his name is Ella. Do you want me to pause this? No, 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 no. <laughs> it, her, her name is Ella, okay? And I'm just going to ask you a rhetorical question. And Ella is a great grandmother of Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah lived in Milwaukee for a little But Oprah, Oprah, her father, is a Winfrey. And that's who Ella married, a Winfrey. So, but the reason why I say just don't, because we have never, as the family, oh, we have never um, tried to hang on to her shirt tail or anything like that, you know, because. You've worked hard on your own, right? Yeah, so it didn't, you know, just, well, we, we had a lot of recognition with the Apple. The staple singer, you know, Mavis is still singing today. That's what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. She's still singing today. 
Uh, but my father telling me the stories of his when he was younger, coming up, how his uncles were working together, what they were, do, how, how, you know, and how they literally prospered, and that, so he didn't instill that into me, you know. So that's why I'm always under the perception that you can do whatever you want to do, because I know I'm a witness. Okay, now when we're talking about, um, like I said, my great grandfather and, it, and my and my grandfathers and his brothers. They were, like I say, they were close friends of Isaiah, okay? Now, and like I say, I was keeping it in the biblical form to where it's, there's a lot of coincidence between when you're reading the scriptures and what happened with me, or what I've seen. Um, we're talking about this town call that Isaiah started, Mount Bayou, Mississippi. This town drew a man into it, a man named Dr. T.R.M. Howard. If you ever look him up, he's considered, his books were written about him, he was the maverick, okay? Now, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, he, uh, he came to Mount Bayou, Mississippi, all right? Lived there, and he provided the state of Mississippi, well, we'll put it like that, with the only zoo that was uh, by blacks. Uh, they had a zoo. There was a lot of hotels. There was a lot of things Dr. Howard did. Now, but he was actually one. He was actually, and this is what you are never gonna hear as far as recorded in history. He was actually one of the first civil rights leaders. Okay, now. When I say that, I know you've heard the name Megar Evers. Megar Evers and his brother, Charles Evers, worked for Dr. Howard because Dr. Howard has started an insurance company also. Okay? You've heard about the uh, industrialist state uh, center or whatever it was, Fannie Lou Hamer. She lived. She worked for Dr. Howard in Mount Bayou. Now, you've heard about Rosa Parks, okay? Rosa Parks, Dr. Howard left um, and did a speech in Montgomery, Alabama to a little church called Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And there was a new minister there that had invited him there. Brand new minister, hadn't him been there a year. That was Martin Luther King. Invited Dr. Howard to speak because there was a particular subject that Dr. Howard was speaking on that he traveled the country talking about it. Now, four days after Rosie Parks heard that speech, she would not move off that bus. Okay, now, Dr. Howard was touring the country talking about uh, Emmett Till, the Chicago boy, 14-year-old Chicago boy that got beat up in Mississippi. That's what Dr. Howard was telling the nation about, okay? Rosa Parks heard that story. Four days later, she wouldn't get up off the bus. Now, that's what we give her credit for, right? But I'm going to tell you how powerful women are, okay? It wasn't, it was Rosa Parks that did it. But there's two other women, or I would say other women, period. But the, the main one, her name is Thelma Glass, okay? She was the president of WPO, the Women's Political Organization, in Montgomery, Alabama, okay? Now, she... Like I said, women, women were, um, I don't know how it was. In my culture, women was only supposed to be 
kept barefoot and pregnant and in the kitchen. That's, that's it. You had no, no voice, per se, but these women had the voice. When they, this is just my personal opinion, okay? When they organized that Rosa, and they actually picked Rosie, Rosa to do it because she didn't have a blemish on her record, per se, and she was the secretary of the NAACP, okay? Even the, the, the president of the NAACP was telling Rosa that uh, the only thing a woman is good for is the kitchen. That's it. That's how, what, what do you call it? Uh, what's that word you use for men that are? No, the, when a man is, a man, chauvinist? there you are, how chauvinist, you know, men were, okay? But, you know, she asked the president, why, well, why, you know, you got me as a secretary? Well, you're a good secretary. <laughs> See, that's the reason. But other than that, women weren't allowed in actually anything. So, but when Rosa sat down, and if you read your history, you find out within 24 hours, okay? Flyers were printed and handed out to students at the schools to take home to their parents. Now, you know yourself that's got to be planned to be, have flyers printed and then saying we're going to boycott the bus company within a 24 hour, you know it was a plan. So it wasn't a coincidence. Now, it went over so well, okay? It went over so well that uh, they said, oh, you know, they had to make their decision that when they had that meeting at night, or should they continue or what should they do? And so they made the decision, these are the women, and actually some men got involved afterwards to continue. Now they're saying what uh, we know men are not gonna follow women. Okay, so we got to find a man. And history tells you what man did they pick. Martin Luther King. See, so sometimes it kind of like bothers me when um, I hear the credit that's given to people, not knowing that, wait a minute, the backbone of a lot of this were hidden, okay? And King, you know, his coming was on the backs of the WPO, Wisconsin Women's uh, Political, Women's Political Organization. And uh, Rose, Rosa Parks, she only was just for a little while, then she moved to Detroit. But the thing is, if you do history, keep it right. And see, there's a lot of people that, that have done things that stay in the background. Now, uh, if you turn and you see the picture right there, mm-hmm, that board right there. Martin Luther King, and you can see Malcolm X in the back. No, that's not Malcolm X. With the glasses? No. Oh. Okay. There's that, and that's a gentleman that you've probably heard. He was Harris, uh, uh, Simon Harris, and he still lives in Milwaukee. I mean, he still works. That's when he was younger. That's how he was younger. But the guy looks, you, you're right, it looks just like Malcolm X. But the guy that's right behind King and looking downward, kind of. With the black suit, not the gray suit? The gray suit and the black tie. Okay. That is Dr. Finlayson. Finlay? Finlayson. Finlayson. Okay. He is a, the founder and owner of North Milwaukee State Bank. All right, now he, he, he brought Martin Luther King to Milwaukee, okay? Then you'll also, he lives in Milwaukee, he's always behind the scenes of going forward. And I think, oh, the other people that, you see, you see Eartha Kitt, you see uh, the Surgeon General there, and down below, but that pitch, that uh, plant is in front of it, Alex Haley, all visited the house, stayed at the house. Okay, but, see, Doc has been my mentor, friend and mentor 
oh, 40 years, 30 years, you know. But he's a friend and he's my mentor, okay, because I know he knows. So it's through what he says and they have told and discussed with me when uh, I sit at his, you know, kitchen table or whatever. And then, of course, with what my father has taught me and told me about his family, and then me physically can actually witness and see, like I can say, Dr. Finlayson and Pollard started North Milwaukee State Bank, which they just sold last, this year, last year. Um, and then what Isaiah Montgomery did, you figure all of that's instilled in you, so you have no recourse but to continue doing what they've done. And that's why my main goal is just to help anybody, you know, be somebody per se. You know, just teach, because I, I consider it all gifts, my talents and skills. Now, home improvement, I can go up against, in the trades, I can go up against anybody that's an electrician. My work is just as, work and knowledge is just as good as his. A carpenter, the same thing. A plumber, the same thing. You know, like I say, the advantage I have over would have over them, just the idea, I literally know how to plaster. Mix mud up and plaster your walls. It's a lost trade, it's a lost, yeah, lost trade, but I can do it. 90% of the other people can't do it. And then I have the degree in electronics, okay? So the thing is, all of those particular gifts, skills, and then to to be fortunate to work at Babcock and Woodcock for 17 years before they closed the plant down and to rise to the level that I was at, I got to witness and see how you actually forge a piece of steel, okay? And when you're talking steel, you think maybe just steel, but you know there's 200,000, over 200,000 different analysis of steel, you know? So everything's different applications. So um, that's why I continue doing what uh, I'm doing. And young people are always, I get thrilled with young people because, you know, I've, it, it has always been, I'd rather talk to a kid than to talk to a person my own age. You know, don't, you know I see some people, Oh, what can I say? How can I say it? Well, some people just talk stupid, period. You know, so I do, but in the men's network here, it, it, this has allowed me to, uh, to live a good life in a sense because you're able to meet people. Now, I told you the men's network here. Um, I'd say I could really... But who has passed through these doors and had breakfast with us, it's got to be at least 500 different people, you know. So, uh, and so you get to meet all of them. And um, so you get to meet people, you know, have breakfast, joke, laugh, there's nothing, and fellowship. That's it. Now, I was real proud of my students there. Um, every one of them will tell you they learned something during the home improvement course, and they appreciate it, you know. Some of them, like I said, we worked on their houses, projects on their homes, and they really like the idea of learning something. Now, you two ladies, when y'all get up there and you have your own home. Uh, and like I say, the kitchen and the bathroom is always, that's the focus of a woman. Kitchen, the bathroom. 
Um, matter of fact, if you bought a house today, what's the first thing you're looking at? <laughs> what's going what's gonna to make you decide to purchase at home? Actually, I bought a house last week. We looked at the basement. <laughs> That's your husband. Mm, I mean, well, I studied architecture, so I'm a little different. But your husband, he, man, we'll put it that way, focused on the basement and garage. Okay, but see, you saying you bought the house for purpose, but what if you were just a regular couple going out to purchase a home? The wife, she's looking at the kitchen and the bathroom, and that's the first thing they want to remodel. And um, the world, the, 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 the salespeople know this, that's why it's so expensive. It's really expensive to remodel a kitchen and a bathroom because they know. I mean, the markup on bathrooms and kitchens is just like jewelry. You know, jewelry is marked up a thousand percent. Bathrooms and kitchens are also. So, but those are the first thing that women, that sales a woman, is the bathroom, well, the kitchen. They just love their kitchen and the bathrooms, and men, the garage, and the basement. Don't care about the bedrooms and all that, it's just, cause he's looking at what he's gonna do. Just like you saying what, you know, since what you're saying, you wanna buy the house, you buying the house actually for a business per se, cause you say you're keeping, you got plans for the attic, to keep him away. That's, you, you, so you don't be disturbed while you're doing whatever you're doing. I know, I said it, it's yours. You, they don't have women caves, do they? <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's what you're making. But I can see what you're, I, I can see what you're saying too. Uh, I see the good point, or I see the point in having a bathroom that's really easy to clean. You can just go in there and wipe it down. Same with the kitchen. Kitchen, if you were a cook, well, it, We'll put it like this. There's a difference between wives today. I hate to say it. My chauvinistic point is going to come out now. Because, see, you're really not going to be a wife. Yeah, you're a wife, but you're not the home-making wife. Because you're going to be a professional. Okay? So you're not going to be the type of wife that's at home She's cooking for a family of four to where she needs space in the kitchen. See, you're not going to be, you know, because you're going to be a professional. Some points of the year, though, I have to harvest the garden and cook all of that. So in September, that's when I want all that storage and space. Oh, yeah, you got to have, you harvest the, so you think you might be doing some canning? Okay, so then that means you gotta have a large kitchen with so you, the big pots. Okay, so that's a hobby and that's a favorite of yours. But on a day to day basis, you're right. I'm not cooking. No, no, you go to the microwave. Uh, <laughs> so that's why I, in a particular business, like I said, I've been through all of the homes. Um, one of the homes that really, well, two homes actually astonished me was Sidney Cole. That's Herb Cole's brother, part of the Cole's family. Went to his house out there in, um, on a, was that Fox Point or River Hills, whatever, Fox Point. And was at his house and it just amazed me all of his um, gutters are copper. Copper gutters. Copper yeah, yeah, I looked at that. And he literally has a clay tennis court. 
you know, clay, the original clay. Now, um, I was fortunate to get into the home of Michael Cudahy, okay? Out there in Cedar, uh, Cedar Grove, what is that? Is that Cedar Grove that's north of here? I'm pretty sure. Cedar, is this, no, uh, Cedarburg? One of the two. Um, now his, his house, he brought from the east side of Milwaukee, he had it moved up there. And I can remember being in the kitchen part of it. And the, the pots hanging from the rack, the ceiling, you know. But I seem, I seem to find him to be a, a nice individual. And uh, I was there uh, repairing a system. And um, he told me, um, Market Electronics was his, the business that he started. Market Electronics. But, and he's also part of the Cudahy family, which is Patrick Cudahy, you know. So, but the thing is, uh, I've been in a lot of homes that have, the people, the homes and the people have inspired me. Now, when I was dating my wife, ex-wife rather, at the beginning, why was that Rufus King? I used to drive out to um, River Hills and Fox Point just to look at the homes. Well, like I said, I was interested in architecture, okay? And I used to drive out there just to see what the homes look like, you know. Beautiful. We used to drive down the street. So, and I've always had that passion for architecture. But anyway, um, like I was getting back with the men's network, I just uh, feel that maybe a little bit of what I do or say or how I do it, how I say it, will rub off onto the other men to where you find out you can do. You can work without killing yourself or you can not help. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big reward to help another individual. It's a big, you, you get it. Myself, personally, I get the self-satisfaction of feel good that you can help someone. Um, so that's what it is with the men's network, be it an adult or the kids. Now, the young kids there, we sponsored a trip till we went to Daniel Boone to teach them how to shoot at the shooting range, you know. Oh, uh, what was the name of the, I forget the name of the event that they were having then, that we took them there and they got a chance to, and that's what those pictures there represent where just show them how to, to appreciate and sight and shoot a rifle. That's all, I forget the name of the, what the event was. But. So I have one question. It takes a little bit of explanation, but I've been studying um, kind of how the north side is stereotyped in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin in general, how Milwaukee is stereotyped by people who live in the suburbs and the rest of the state. But I um, feel like it's all kind of connected. People will look at rundown buildings and say, that's a neighborhood in trouble or it's a dangerous neighborhood, but they don't realize the history through the last 50, 100 years, just restrictive zones, covenants and zoning and redlining. And then recent history of foreclosures and banks. Um, and how, how, the, how that kind of, how it kind of comes to be. Um, and then on the other hand, so you've got kind of these financial structures in the city government that is taking money out of the city and not putting it back in. 
on the other hand, you also have I want to, uh, mass incarceration, taking lives out of the city and not putting them back, not putting, not, not trying to rehabilitate, but also redefining criminals. And I feel like you've got buildings kind of going into foreclosure or being abandoned, but you've also got the people who do the maintenance and the care and the next generation of people who do that kind of handiwork that are being taken away. Um, so I guess my question is, do you do what you do to kind of battle stereotypes, or do you do what you do just because it's there? Wow. I, I, you could actually say, Mm. See, I can't say the battle stereotypes, okay? Because I told you about I, Joseph Davis, okay? Now, he, he had to have liked or loved Benjamin to let him be the overseer of a complete plantation and, and to encourage him to build a community, okay? So, now, I told you about my grandfather, okay? My grandfather... I mean, my great-grandfather, he took care of major um, staples. And it was, we don't know if it was the major's wife or daughter that literally went to the War Department and fought so that my great-grandfather would get a pension. Can you imagine someone advocating for a slave? He, gets a, he deserves a pension or whatever. So he received that pension. So, and... That's why I can't have no hard feelings toward a white because I, I physically have seen, you know, witnessed in what has transpired. But to answer your question as far as to battle stereotype, no, it's just the idea I need to show the men that come here. Uh, excuse my language, but stop, you got the, the, so-and-so complaining God damn it, you can do it. There's nothing that you can't do. Now, think about this. I told you, I, I walked right up the ladder at Babcock and Wilcox, okay? And um, to where the, I was the high mill foreman, the big cheese in that department, or like I say, it's the most prominent position in the plant. Now, how did I get there? Had to have been someone to say, okay, let's give him a chance. At each step of the way that I elevated myself, okay? And we know the person that was saying, okay, let's give him a chance, was white. So now, those people above me that elevated me to get these positions, uh, we know they didn't have a sour taste in their mouth. It's just the ones everybody below you, and that's just common. They're going to have a, 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 a soured feeling because, hell, I wanted the job, you know. So uh, stereotypes, I didn't have to, didn't have to battle, I don't battle, it's just the idea, of, I do what I do because you can do it. Stop complaining. You can do it. You know, don't be so damn lazy. That's all. That's just the bottom line. Of course, you can do. And see, I had to look at the Almighty. He has allowed me to get all of the gifts and the opportunities to meet who I've met. Okay? Now, one thing I left out um, in the course of my life is after Babcock and Wilcox closed and after I went to ITT, tech and got my uh, degree, I started working for a company called Best Power. Okay, now, I know you don't know what Best Power is, but you've seen it, never recognized it. It's, a, it's an uninterruptible power system. Battery power that actually is, that's a small one, but now you've got some humongous ones too that takes care of complete computer rooms, okay? They provide search protection and filtered power, what have you. But it transfers, it generates AC 
power using DC. So you're inverting. Right now, everybody just knows of a converter to convert AC over to DC so they can charge their phone. But how about going backwards, inverting, taking DC power, inverting it, making AC power. And that's what the UPS systems do. But anyway, I worked for uh, Best Power. I was a contractor for Best Power. And my territory was the state of Wisconsin, okay? And I went as far north as Octanagan, Michigan, which is by Lake Superior. The furthest east I went, and actually it's just a lake, but if you go south, the furthest east, east, east I went was uh, United States Steel, service there. And south and west, uh, Dubuque, Iowa, and then south, uh, but those were emergency jobs because their technicians was probably, you know, but I did a lot of the, the west side of uh, the west section of west suburbs of Chicago. But the point I'm trying to make is during the course of traveling all around the states and whatever, servicing this equipment, I got into over a thousand businesses and factories and whatever. So, and the mingling with the, my contact people there the majority of them had constructive words to say, and they were real nice people that I've met. Now, and we're seeing 99% of all of the places I visit, my contact persons were white, you know? And we became friends, per se. There's one guy, I, st I still remember the day, and I just, I, I, sometimes I just think about, uh, think about him. I know he's gone, but in Manitowoc, you no, know, Manitowoc or Sheboygan, one of the two, I serviced a company there, and I had left a little small screwdriver there on my previous visit. Do you know a year later, because I was making you know, your routine preventive maintenance, a year later when I come back, he said, well, Mike, you know, you left your screwdriver. And now, this guy, uh, he was an older gentleman, and he was the one that actually founded the company. Mash, Mashlin, Mashlin, they make stuff dealing with the automobile, you know. But he had all of his Republican um, pins on the wall. He was a staunch Republican, okay? And he had his pins there, party, was it the party pins or whatever, cards. And he, when he and I, I like talking to him. Oh, love talking to him because he was literally in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. He was in there. He was in it. And I like to talk to people that were involved in something that you see movies about all the time. So, so he was under Patton's command, but he told me about, he told me a story, he said, well, Mike, I trained at uh, Camp, Camp Shelby in Mississippi, and he was the only white there, you know, officer there, you know, in the camp. So he had some stories that sometimes I would, kind of be late for my other service call because when I did them, I always picked cities along my route. If I had service call to do my first, if I was leaving, going that direction, my first uh, service call would be with uh, Ozaki County Courthouse, which is in Port Washington, okay? Then your next stop is Sheboygan. That's where there's a water filtration and a couple other plants there. Then I go to Manitowoc. But I always make sure I end up in Green Bay because that was before Potawatomi and you had uh, Oneida. I'd always want to go to the casino. So that's the way I'm, because you could make up your own schedule. But anyway, the thing is, 99% of all of my clients or contact people were white and they were all encouraging, encouraging people, you know. So um, I even met the lady did I meet her? No, I was at the company. 
That woman, I don't know if you ever heard the American doll. It's a doll that costs about two or three hundred dollars. Mm. Right here in, on the other side of Madison is where. And she was a school teacher. Before, she was a school teacher. And being a school teacher, she, it kind of like bothered her that we would have dolls. And she wanted to make the dolls they have a, have a story behind the doll, you know. So, I I remember doing doing that plant over there on the, and see, like I say, during the course of my going around the state, going to a lot of facilities, I got encouraged by a lot of people. So that's why. So that's why I do the things that I do because. And when you speak of t stereotype, they don't, it's only a very few people that I actually have, you know, a nasty attitude that's within this city here, or the suburbs per se. Because um, the biggest honor is, like I said, when you got a prominent person that, re that will request that you come and personally do work for them. See, as, as far as I'm concerned, that's an honor, you know, that they respect me enough or think highly of my particular work and character that they will let me wander around in their home doing what I got to do. So that's why I do what I do, and that's why You were mentioning foreclosed homes, homes that are falling apart. That's because a little bit of laziness then got in there. Laziness and and not having any experience. Like I say, if you can teach a person how to use a hammer, now when they see the porch falling apart, they'll see how simple and easy it is to repair it instead of letting it completely fall down. That's all, you know, so. Well, I don't have any further questions. Chelsea, do you have? No, is there anything you'd like to say? Anything you popped into your head? And no, no, no. I think I didn't said enough, right? I just said a mouthful. We didn't in the beginning. We didn't get you to say your name. Could you just briefly introduce yourself? I did say my name was Michael Staples. I said that. Okay. Cause you went through testing, testing, testing. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I wasn't recording. During oh, that. you weren't recording. Well, okay, it's Michael Staples, and I am. Now, who am I? I am the third son of George Staples, who was the son of Jim Staples, who is the son of William Staples. And like I say, all of those pictures right there, those are all of, that's from one of our family reunions of three, four years ago. Put it together, that's all the ones that served in uh, the military. Now my niece there, the lady, the girl, uh, yeah, she was blown up twice. In IED or whatever, you, in, she was in the Air Force. And uh, if you look and see her today, you wouldn't even know that uh, she's had some real severe, whew, that's what, um, mm-hmm. And see, the thing is, and I didn't know when I, 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 I you feel sorry for her, she, no, Miranda almost, she gotta be about five, 10, maybe. 10 or 11 but anyway and it it didn't dawn on me till someone said something to think about it because my sister which is her mother while it was in Japan when, when she went to Japan when they rushed her to Japan to get the surgery done you know now you're in testes if you pull them out how do you put them back in what's there's no roadmap. See, so 
that was the comp that was the, yeah to think about it that's in testes just go back and forth right so if the they pulling these out to get shrapnel out of there now you got to put it back do you stuff it in or i see i'm not in the, in the medical field but that's the complication that she has had since uh she's retired now after about i think it 16 years 17 years she was in the two tours she did in, in iraq but so she had the complications and when she gets the complication it's severe complication it's all stemmed from not putting them back but i guess when you're in a emergency situation like that there's not no time to sit and draw a map on how you put intestines back in there so since then she's had a couple problems but uh now i'm proud of her because she i hate i i always like war stories so i want to hear her story but then i don't want to hear her story to to go so she doesn't want to relive anything but she'll tell me some particular things but uh Miranda's about about your age she's in her 30s yeah. but uh the thing is everybody up there was in the military service and then there's few several more but Miranda who is I'm really just proud of because she smiles today she laughs and she doesn't have no and she can tell me a, a story um she says uncle michael i said what well, miranda what would have happened she would tell it okay the i hit the ied the uh jeep flipped over and she's in the air force but she's traveling with army marine and the other people that are in the that are in the vehicle and they nicknamed her Condi because of Condoleezza Rice so that's what the other soldiers were calling her Condi and she tells a story but she tells the story so well I, don't, I hope I don't do any damage to it but um, she's saying the jeep flipped over they're there the men got out and she's there they left her there at the vehicle okay now she's fussing and cussing y'all done left me alone or whatever blah 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 and they saying S -s stay down condy or whatever they're telling her but then i said what what happened then and she, she just said one well, of the marines took him out the person that was sniping at him that was snipe he said the marine took him out you know in the way she said it it's just the idea that she had the confidence in the people that she was with that they got her back you know while she just she t tells a story letting you know she has the confidence but then yet she was fussing like oh i don't know what you know because they done left her she's at that jeep by herself you know and someone's sniping at her you know and she doesn't have the weapon you know the men that squirted away, they got the weapons, but that's the horrors of war. I've never had the, the pleasure, but that's why I listen to all the stories. And like I said, the best stories I've always heard was the gentleman that Mashland Industries of Wisconsin, that's what it is, Mashland Industries of Wisconsin, up there in Sheboygan or Manitoba, one of the two. I have to look at my paperwork. But he would tell me the stories of uh, uh, World War II and tank division down in Camp Shelby. See, now see, I, there's a reason for me collecting these stories, okay? Because now, well, you figure about another 10, 20 years, I can, by the time I reach the wheelchair, I can sit back and lie. Because I had heard this man's story, you know, so I can put myself in it, no one would never believe, you know. <laughs> Story, stories bring us together. Yeah. That's why 
That's why we all enjoy this project. Yeah. No, you can hear some stories that, uh, like I said, I've heard quite a few. And we had one time I, I made it uh, Storytelling Tuesday. That's what we had it for the breakfast. And I wanted everybody to come in. Well, I told them, you know, ahead of time, I want you to come with your best story. The best story or the best joke, lie or whatever. And uh, it turned out to be a real, it was a full session that Tuesday. And everybody was, really enjoyed themselves because we had one guy, the owner of Reed's Funeral Home. He told the best story. He told the best one. Oh, it just went over. But Ellis Bayless, the gentleman that's up there, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a uh, big game hunter. He's actually the one you consider won the contest because he had a lot of real good stories that you couldn't tell which was the truth and which was the lie. You know, he, he could mesh, he could really mesh it together, okay? So, that particular Tuesday was, it, turned, it worked out well for us. Now, those pictures there, all right, that's the ball that the Men's Network had five, six years ago. We had a, we had a ball. Um, This is a building, well, you see the pictures over there, that's when we had, uh, oh, Eunice, pa Eulis Payne and Thelma Silas come and talk a little about business and investments, working, and gave us a whole lot of encouragement. Now, prominent people. When you go to that wall over there, okay? There's a lady. She's on the far right hand side and she's the second row of pictures on the bottom, okay? Now, her name is Artie Hallier. Okay? Artie Hallier. Have you ever heard of Hallier before that name or anything like that? Hallier Park. There you go. Park is named after her husband, Wilbur. Uh -huh. And how your park, what business do they have? Or Miss or how your what business? Well, I know that the freeway ends up going through there. Mm -hmm. But um, the, they started Columbia Savings and Loan. Now, Columbia Seems Alone is right down here on 20th and North Avenue, Walnut. Okay? That's Columbia Seems Alone. Now, Miss Hallier, she also was a personal friend of mine. Miss Hallier, I always tell everybody, she is the one that got me in church. I was working on her house. And she says, Mr. Staples, uh, you know, a man needs to be in church. She says, and she went on to tell me, she says, I go to church, I go to so-and-so, but I'm not telling you to come to my church, but a man needs to be in church. So, listen to her talk, and she was talking to me. I started going to church. I come to this church because, you know, here is a was a prominent person, and... Um, at that time, and um, she was saying, just as a bit of knowledge, man needs to be in church. And see, I credit that to Miss Miss Hallier. So, uh, in the course of my lifetime, I've had uh, the opportunity to meet some some prominent, not so prominent people, and and have had. Oh, Jesus, a thousand conversations, thousands of conversations with about any and everything. So, 
What can I say? If I die tomorrow, I lived a happy life. I mean, I an enjoyable. I'm not. I have no complaints. I can't think of a complaint. Uh, I mean, I've had my share of uh, disagreements with the police and the tax man and the city and everybody else, but those are just normal complaints. But in the long run, I'm not complaining. Let me see who else. Now, those are some. Well, Dr. Finlayson is up there because he was here that day that we uh, took those pictures. But a lot of pretty well, a lot of people come, have visited the breakfast to try to encourage and teach us to, you know, move forward. And that's all I want the men to do is to move forward. So, I think you got it all, right? I think so. All right, so thank you so much for your time and your knowledge um, and your support of this project and the neighborhood. Um, again, this has been Lena Jensen with the 2017 BLC Field School. This interview was with Mr. Mike Staples at the Men's Network Building in Sherman Park, Milwaukee, um, Wisconsin, and it will be stored at the UWM's Golden Meyer Library Archives. Thank you again, Mr. Okay. Staples. Uh, no problem. You're welcome. Now, French and foreign affairs. <laughs> yes. Now, you seem like a nice individual. Yes. 